virtual grads today. My name is Biljana Petkova and I'm a professor of law at the faculty here. In my work, I focus on federalism um, and as of late, urban law, on courts, European law, privacy and freedom of speech in the digital age. So as I've mentioned this morning, we are fortunate enough to welcome the keynote of Professor Judith Resnick, um, who is the Arthur Lyman Professor of Law at Yale Law School. Judith's career spans issues of federalism, civil procedure, courts, prisons, non-discrimination and citizenship. Her scholarship focuses on the relationship of democratic values to government services such as courts, prisons, post offices, so she works on forms um, on justice provided through collective redress and uh, contemporary conflicts over the outsourcing and privatization of dispute resolution processes, the relationship of states to citizens and non-citizens, the forms and norms of federalism and equality and gender. So Judith Resnick is um, my hero. She has argued for women's rights in front of the US Supreme Court and has published on subjects as varied as migration, citizenship, gender, and on the relationship between courts and democracy. Her books include Representing Justice, Invention, uh, Controversy and Rights in City-States and Democratic Courtrooms. From mapping the images of justice and um, tracking the development of public spaces, in particular courthouses dedicated to justice, in that book, Professor Resnick uh, and co-author Dennis Curtis have analyzed how Renaissance rights of judgment turned into democratic rights, requiring um, governments to protect judicial independence and to provide open and public hearings. So Professor Judith Resnick has been instrumental um, for the Arthur Lyman Center for Public Interest Law that promotes equal access to justice and um, for the Lyman Center at Yale researching reform in the criminal law system. Um, so without further ado, Judith, the digital floor is, is yours. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, first, thank you. Uh, second, it is early in the US morning where I have been lucky enough to come in person. I'm sure I would be jet lagged, so I'll try to assume that however intelligent I am, intelligible I am or not, it would have been more or less the same. Um, although I'm very sorry, of course, not to have gotten to visit. Uh, in the book that, that uh, Biljana mentions, um, there's actually an image from a, a, a last judgment in Graz. So I was, uh, which I have not been to. So I was particularly eager to get a site visit, uh, but um, that, the world doesn't let us do that. On the other hand, I'm incredibly grateful for the resources and electricity that we all have. There are many parts of the world get, that can't zoom to each other for a whole host of reasons. So our wellness in being able to be together in this forum and the magic of the ability to talk and see with each other at the same time is, uh, to be, is something I'm deeply aware is not on our global governance uh, unpacking dimensions of law and politics, this is not a luxury that is shared by everyone. And I'm keenly aware of that as I uh, get to consume some of it. So I'm gonna talk about two forms of governance that has been global, that is global, that is often not in the repertoire of global discussions such as this. And I also need to preface this by saying that because it, you began at what was the middle of the night for the United States or 3.30 in the morning, I'm sorry I missed what has come before. And I'm hoping that I will be able to interact with it in a way that your comments and questions will enable me and I'm able to stay for the rest of it, but not to, I didn't, I, I missed where you began. So apologies on that score. So what I need to say before I start and have learned to move the slides, I hope, um, is that I'm a jurisdiction skeptic. I do think a great deal about federalism. I run Yale's Global Constitutional Seminar. I think cross borders a fair amount as well as internally and spend time on sovereignty as well. And I uh, think it critical that we all engage with the questions of jurisdiction, but I 
don't think jurisdiction is the answer to the social and political problems that we have. Those go to the substantive norms that jurisdictions either come together about or split over. So with that, by way of a quick preface, what I want to start with is geopolitical bureaucracy starting global governance toward the end of the uh, 1800s. And the first one is called the Universal Postal Union, or UPU. I mean, it has a slightly different name in its very beginning. And as you will see here, because I've learned how to turn a slide, there, people came together in 1874 for a Treaty of Bern to imagine a reciprocal, to insist, to provide, to create, a reciprocal exchange of correspondence and imagine an entire territory of the union which has free conduit. Now, those of us who live in an internet age, let alone the one that these people produced, might not have been aware that to mail a letter, you had to pay on receipt. It went a circuitous route. There were sometimes bilateral treaties and by a little few hundred, a few decades before this, uh, 23 states with, I'm looking at Christine Langford is joining me, one of my colleagues from whom I've learned a great deal. Germany was one of the places that was central to generating early multilateral agreements. And this is a big leap forward because now it was 20 some, but then of course it grew. And we all take for, or so many of us get to take for granted that I can put a piece of paper with a, a thing, which is actually a form of a universal currency into, in the United States, a blue box near my house, and that it will end up with all of you in relatively short order is to be an admired um, accomplishment of this 1874 treaty that over the course of the 20th century came to provide in the United States something called rural free delivery, because we are an expansive and urban as well as rural. Um, English economists were the people who figured out that you shouldn't price per piece, but you could actually make economies of scale and economic analysis that it was better to have a flat price and thereby have more use. The penny post was the phrase in England. It um, helped generate the U.S. Constitution, talks about the U.S. federal government having power over post roads, and the U.S. used it. And to be clear, this was in service of capitalism, imperialism, colonialism, as well as interpersonal interactions of other kinds. So as in this form of global governance, as in so many others, it's a multi-animated, multi-motivated agenda. And you can see here in the next slide, I hope, um, there, the British Post, most of the majestic public information system we've got, because people can talk to each other and communicate across place and space. And in the United States, that's a quote from the U.S., it's bringing the nation together. This is a pol political propaganda, early promoted as a way to sit, spread the word of what we wanted, or some people wanted the United States to look like, but personal, educational, literary business, prompt, reliable services across the United States. Remarkable ambitions that came to look so seamless. 1891, moving forward through the 20th century, and still going on, which is the next quick slide here, still going on. And here is uh, in EU, I'm here in your, in your a 1997 director from the EU, EU Parliament and the Council of ensuring permanent post, affordable prices, universal service providers, and the Congress, the Universal Postal Union's 140th anniversary, talking about migration, flourishing trade, now using the word electronic, because of course, here we are looking at a world that is not only quite a stunning service, but an incredibly now vulnerable service. With the decline in the use of paper mail, many of these services are struggling to figure out price. This cross subsidy, because, because the US wanted to mail around the world or Germany, we helped produce and subsidize and incentivize our counterparts all over the world. What happens 
now the great majestic British Post has the Royal Mail's privatizing privatized. I mean, there's issues of public and private, U.S. as well. We, it was a huge tumult and uproar over efforts by the former president of the United States to pack the board of the post office and change the pricing system. You've got free riders, meaning competitors who are private mail services in the United States. One of the examples is Federal Express. What does it use for its distribution system? It interlocks with the U.S. Postal Service, but it also uses all of us have zip codes, little codes that are mail. U.S. tax payers did that with their funds in the 1960s and 70s when the U.S. Post Office realized it was a good idea and am now, of course, being used. So where are the cross-subsidy obligations for private providers? Not. Well, the pricing system regulated enough? Not. And how will they commit to rural free delivery or up air all over the country, all over the world? These are global governance problems of the 21st century. And obviously, I actually started with a reference to the luxury of our electricity. In some places, post offices in some countries become hubs for internets. Some of them are becoming banking services. There are a variety of new inventions in this way. But the real functioning question is, will this continue to be a vital government service in the service of itself, as all government services generally are, but particularly certain of them, as well as in services of the population. And one of the saddest notes, I've written some about this, obviously, from what I'm talking about, is um, the U.S. Post Office used to be uspostoffice.gov, G-O-V, which is our little part on EDU for education. If you're emailing me, well, now it's .com, C-O-M, as in one of many commercial outlets. So this is a first glimpse at a global governance system that responded to closed borders by opening them in ways that were once radical. You were inspected as a mail deliverer at the border. Now you can get through. And was driven by economic and social utility, had enormous flourishing and praise, and is now wobbling. And of course, one poignant question in the world of Europe, and I read Schengen is now in question again, is whether or not the movement of people can be imagined in a similar way. And of course, we know we have conventions that instantiate the walls of sovereignty and that generally recognize rights of exit, but have not yet, there's no international migration um, convention, although there are drafts of them that are Argue, that are arguing to think about the universality of the issues of people's movement the way there is universal acceptance now of object movement uh, with conflicts over who will fund it and how to subsidize it. So first example of global governance, one that I think needs to be, um, as you can hear, more a part of our conversation than has been in the past to think through its parallels and dissimilarities with the, I know there were discussions of health and other issues earlier with uh, parallel sets of questions. What motivates and animates the radical ambitions that work uh, as what Leonard Wolf, uh, Virginia Woolf's spouse and a very famous English writer said, or publisher said, a quiet revolution. He noticed this in the early part of the 20th century. Hello, the world is changing and no one's really making a big deal about it. And it's transforming all of our lives. So this is example one, and now I want to turn to a second. I'm just going to use two examples. And the second example is something that also most people, uh, you all may be exceptions, but most people I talk to in global governance circles have not heard of something called the International Penal Penitentiary Commission, which was a transnational organization from 1872 to 1951 that was about how you punish people the role of prisons as a transnational. And of course, it's also an example of what's sovereign, where are borders relevant, where are they not? And to begin there, I need to point out that just as in mail services and education, what becomes an issue for political and social theory is itself a question. And here credit, um, slide moving, credit for the Western version of this, I'm just gonna talk about Europe and the United States and South and Central America, but a little bit about the other parts of the world, 
not extensively, but some. And so in the context of the European experience, an Ita Marquis in Italian, Cesar Beccaria, wrote a monograph, published it anonymously because he was afraid it would be heresy and he could get punished for it, on a theory of sovereign power that argued, and was he was early, as you can see, an early utilitarian as well, that argued that sovereigns needed to think about why and when they punished and to limit the forms of punishment. And here, the, his a quote that is often, and Jeremy Bentham very much drew on and uh, praised Beccaria. So the Beccaria, Jeremy Bentham, the Englishmen are in conversation immediately and directly. Uh, and so here we see the greatest possible happiness or the least possible unhappiness, better to prevent crimes than to punish them. So first a prevention kind of concept. This is putting punishment on the political map. And it was just something sovereigns could do. And then it became something that needed forms of justification. And so uh, his next basic, oh, this is uh, condensed, um, to obtain its end, the evil it inflicts should, should, has only to exceed the advantage derived. All severity before that, beyond that is superfluous. And for that reason, tyrannical. So he's developing a principle of limitations and he was radical for his age. This is a famous frontispiece that he designed, which is a justice image, turning away from the proffered severed heads because Becker had thought capital punishment was not within the repertoire of uh, justifiable punishments by the sovereign state. And so this actually image for any of you who live inside criminal punishment travels the world in an example of someone from the 17, this is a frontispiece from a 1767 French volume that we have here at my law school, but as he was widely translated around the globe. And you can see here that he had these precepts of public prompt, necessary and proportionate, but my cat, and dictated by law, he and Jeremy Bentham really thought common law judges were unfettered and you needed to be fettered and wanted legislators to make these decisions. So if we have a political theory of governance here, but what he also insisted on in his proportionality, what he thought was okay are things that today many people would find nauseating, fetters, chains, rods, yoke, cage of iron, are things that were um, within the repertoire. So what we can say is calling for proportionality a substantive principle that sounds great and that is sometimes seen as therefore mild to moderate doesn't necessarily translate in the physical experiences of the people who are so punished. Now, this is a theory, it's a theory of punishment that is transnational in its uh, uptake and in its import. And so I'm bringing you to Amsterdam and here, is global governance, and now for Biljana, a city-state, cities are at the score, at the core of this. Amsterdam was losing population in the uh, 1780s, 1770s and 1780s. A man named Fouquet, who was a, 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 an art dealer, gathered together a hundred prints to advertise the great virtues of the city of Amsterdam to attract people. And one of the things in there, it's got a hundred folios or so, and about a quarter of them are devoted to showing you buildings of control and detention. This is the Men's House of Correction. You could see old age, you could see um, several other forms of confinement facilities. This building is the largest one built during those decades in Amsterdam. And it is proudly displayed in service of saying, come to Amsterdam. It's a place that's tidy. It's a place that's ordinary or organized. It's a place that has discipline. And another one of these images, and this is actually on the wall of one of my colleagues at Columbia's uh, office because his grandfather was an art dealer in Amsterdam, an antique dealer. Um, so he has this folio. So this is inside in your seat. So it's, it's sorry, it's far away. A man's being whipped, blocked, and other people are watching because he's being forced labor. That's what all those uh, piles of wood are. And whether this person was laboring enough or not, this person is being casual observers are watching 
the disciplinary authority of the state being displayed, not hidden. I'm sorry, Foucault, who's a theorist of, of control and discipline that suggests more about the hidden part. It's very visible and it's in service of the authority. So um, glorifying the authority of the state is one part of this, but toward the end of the 1700s and the beginning of the 1800s, with the birth of a thing called the penitentiary, comes a strong sense of a need for its reform. And the next image, is from an English, uh, a, a print after an English painting. And the book is, and the print is inspired by an English novel telling you how terrible French prisons are. This is supposed to be the Bastille. And so here we are cross border with the prisoner as an object of concern in a saintly glow, if you saw it up close, it's quite a, a, a powerful image. And this is one, this is the segue into another form of a social movement. So there's a social movement of control and correction. And then there's a movement that says, wait a second, proportionality and some forms of moderation and look at the subjugation and the misery of this man who is being beset. Obviously, some of these people are political prisoners, but certainly not all of them. And here comes the new sociology. Our professionalization comes into being during the 18 or late 18 and 1900s, and with, I know medicine was on the screen earlier today, psychology, psychiatry, criminology, penology, corrections, sociology, anthropology, all of these are coming together. And the folks who are running prisons seek to identify themselves, distinguish themselves, because people who ran prisons before were often philanthropists. And there were, by the way, again, on the cities, Philadelphia, London had societies for reform of prisons, caregiving. So it's religious, it's social networks, it's philosophy, and it's philanthropy, out of which grows a separate discipline called corrections, the people who run prisons because penitentiaries span the globe in not long order. And so, and these people, by the way, were operating against uh, transportation as in exile to the, to, the, to the colonies and physical corporal punishment, uh, death and execution. And so they are reforming. This is an enlightenment reform and they see it as light years better than what came before. And so here you're in Cincinnati, Ohio at the first national congressional congress i.e. a geopol a first a national organization. So it's scaling up on our federalism vector. It was local, it was state. There was a question about whether Philadelphia, which had a huge isolation system under the Quakers, was a good thing as compared to a work system in Auburn, New York. And then these folks come together and the then governor of the state of Ohio is Rutherford B. Hayes, who goes on to be the president of the United States not long after this. And so this is 100 years later, they're putting up a poster that says, here's where it began, a national Congress. And this national Congress um, created a declaration of principles, the Cincinnati principles, about how you're supposed to treat prisoners to improve from the early prison reformers wanted clean prisons, but menial and uh, basically aggressive and useless labor. This new system is reform, not just Christian redemption, but um, moral reform that makes you a useful citizen again, and therefore useful work as well as religion, as well as discipline become the kind of tripod for these movement folks. And these people in 1870 say, hey, let's go to Europe. And there's a Russian who comes to this, this Congress has people from outside the United States. And there actually were before at Frankfurt, and in, and in Belgium, two earlier conferences in 1847 and 1857, interrupted by the 1840s European wars. And then this comes in and the Russians and the Americans and a whole bunch of others say, we're gonna go to London. And in London, they create this International Penal Penitentiary Commission. Member states send delegates, have representatives, they have a governing board, and it's the, as our 
then President Rutherford B. Hayes going to Congress to try to get money for the U.S. contingent to go, the Congress in Stockholm, because it went from London to Stockholm, it was Prague, Paris, Rome, the great capitals of Europe were hosting every five years things called Congresses, where they have resolutions, Act de Congrès, the French materials, thank goodness I can read some, uh, and they have these long descriptions of how everybody punishes everybody, comparative work, many discussions, all trying to do something better. And in the name of what they say, they do absolutely, they tolerate bread and water, irons, fetters, caging, solitary confinement, dark rooms, corporal punishment, all sorts of things, all in the name of redemption and rehabilitation and global conversation. It's not American exceptionalism. It's not Europe. We're in it. And, and because of colonialism and imperialism, many of these Congresses are always going to the monarch's palaces as part of their activities. You see a global engagement with these issues. Um, and it's, but just to be clear, this is a picture from an English prison in 1902. You're looking at the backs of men on things called tread wheels, or in English, it would be tread mills, in US English, sorry. And there are seven steps, and they uselessly are made endlessly to do this. I just wanted to try to get, and there are other gross pictures, but I'm not going to give you them. This is what was in the name. This geopolitical grand transnational had in its membership this effort at discipline as in control, visible and pathetically aggressive on human autonomy. Now, they all describe this as a march of progress and World War I comes with a thud. And there's a hiatus and they meet for the first time in 1925 back in London. And there, by then organized, there's a Howard League is the name of a penal reform organization in England. And they're led by a wonderful group of women and mostly the story I've told you is about men who are at the center of this. And if I move at least to a gender binary, the females enter because women are part of the reform. The women of the Howard League and the men of the Howard League say, wait a second. What we need is an international convention on the rights of prisoners. And they use the word rights and they call prison torture. And they say to the International Penal Penitentiary Commission, you should go to the fore of this. Well, initially they're met with a very tepid response from the guys who are running this and talk about the ladies of the Howard League. But in 1920s, in the early 20s, as you know, the League of Nations is founded. The League of Nations has some interest in prison. There's a debate about whether or not this is a topic for sovereignty, national. Is there any transnational? What are the interactions? And these incredibly astute feminist politicians who, some of whom understood about prisons from suffragettes being in prison in England, along with conscientious objectors and people whose sexual identities didn't fit the English official mode. And England was big into flogging and whipping, by the way, it's, uh, as it uh, controlled its people. They went, they, they went to the International Bureau of the Howard League for Prison Reform. So now I'm telling you about an NGO that is incredibly astute and goes to Geneva and says to the League of Nations, get on this case. And the guys of the International Penal Penitentiary say, whoa, we better get ahead of this thing. So they take up this project of making things called standards. And for the first time, well, so this is Marjorie Fry, who's one of the amazing leaders of this. And then for the first time in 1934, because I'm going to get to the end of the, I'm going to get to this century before we pause. For the first time, the international body, the League of Nations, promulgates something. Now, they're not a convention, but the Howard League wins in some ways. And it says it's from a humanitarian and uh, point of view and social point of view, which is to underscore for you that this is not a rights-based regime. So it's not a legal claim. It's a sociological claim about humanitarianism, which is actually a philosophical movement at the time. And in the context of this, they say things like, Give them enough food and water, like footnote how awful it was that people didn't have food and water. And then you can see I've excerpted their, their many more, 50 rules plus. Corporal punishment is permitted as long as it's organized. And according to law and the docs, we got medicine and law regulating but not prohibiting. And dark cell is also permitted as well. 
So now, just to be clear, there's a standard, the standard minimum rules, this is the English Her Majesty. You have a front end stamp. It's sent country by country. It's distributed globally in order to try to get people to hone to this. They're very clear. They're trying to get money and resources. This is capitalism, as well as rent seeking, as well as improving the lives of the people. It's a mixed story, all of this. So they bring, they promulgate these rules, they spread them around. Now, I've just given you two dates that are stunning. This is 1934 and 1936. 1935, this International Penal Penitentiary Commission has its every year five-year Congress, and it was planned as it had been in 1930, it was in Prague, and in 1935, it moved to Berlin. Between 1933, Hitler takes control which is to say the ladies from the Howard League and a few others, Jews and non-Jews across various countries say, don't go there, we shouldn't participate, but march the Americans and the Brits and a whole bunch of others to Berlin in 1935, where they are in fact greeted with Heil Hitler and told about how Nazis control people and learn something indeed about the camps as well and continue their conversation. And the International Penal Penitentiary Commission, which is seated in Bern, is sitting there with its um, uh, with its projects in its neutralness, because in a world in which you think about this, and it's all justified as expertise, apolitical, non-political, administrative, fascists and ostensibly Democrats can sit together in deciding how to manage the thing called prisons. And then what happens, and this is just in the archives, the United Nations has the archives, which I, many, many boxes, I came across this 25 page jaw drop, painful to read in French single space, chapter and verse five years after Hitler takes control, telling you, listing the names of more than 90 dead people, many of them socialists identified and trying to create a court to the world, stop the destruction that has happened in the first five years. This is in the archives of the IPPC. Of course, the world knows about Kristallnacht and much else, and yet, there is an ongoing toleration. World War II comes and upends this enterprise. The United Nations is founded and this apolitical expert apparatus becomes toxic in the new geopolitical uh, environment. And so the US pulls the plug which was central and, in, and this is the last Congress, Congress held at The Hague in US, uh, the people who run the US prison system are at the center of it. You'll see it's a white male dominated, very few people from the uh, part of, from Asia or other parts of the world who are the uh, centerpiece. And here we move to, although it formally ends, the practice of five-year Congresses of international transnational experts continues to this day under the United Nations, which continues to have things called standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners which is 1955 UN is the first one. And here's where words that were missing for 300 years, except for the ladies from the Howard League, rights and dignity make their way onto paper. Because after World War II teaches people that all of us can be in detention in grotesque settings, a new concept takes some hold that the people in detention are peers and equals who have to be treated with some form, some protection against the state, but don't again be starry eyed because in there on that screen, it says the prison system shall not accept as incidental to justifiable segregation or the maintenance of discipline, aggravate the suffering. That's a great big loophole helped drafted by the way, by people in the United States in part. And so here are some principles. Finally, corporal punishment is formally and dark cells pushed out not to be used completely prohibited under this guidance rules. These are still not binding, it's the UN provisions, and it's not a convention either. It's never been a convention, but it, but it does talk about reduction of diet, that's bread and water, close confinement, that solitary confinement remains in some ways potentially licit. So moving on, I want to be clear, just as I was a little bit with the example of the newspapers and coming toward closer to a conclusion, the fact that these things are said doesn't mean that they're real in the lives of people subjected to them. This is geopolitical governance here. 
So I've given you, I've reproduced a, a piece of paper filed by a man named Winston Talley in 1965 in the United States. I'm going to use the U.S. as an example because I have been somewhat cross-cultural, cross-country, mostly in Europe and the United States, but none in, only. But I want to be clear about the miseries in the United States, um, which uh, have much to redeem uh, still to this day. You can't read it very easily, but what Winston Talley hand-penned, and here's a little excerpt that may be a little clear, but maybe not. It says, and the whip destroyed. Because Arkansas was a federal was a state prison system that officially whipped people in response to their failure to pick enough okra and strawberries in the field. So it's a it's a prison system. The state of Arkansas has no budget line for its prisons. It's all run by sweat labor, and the discipline is imposed to make people work 10, 12, 14 hours in the field. And I give you here the before the 1960s, judges would have said, Pooh, that's administration. It doesn't have any claims of right, but starting in the 60s, 65 is here, and a federal judge in Arkansas, these are the tally petitioners. White men who, along with black men, were being beaten and whipped, and there's the whip that was being used, and there is a hearing about this. And for those of you who, um, and let me just give you, they, as a result of the first hearing in 1965, where a federal judge says, you can do this as long as it's regulated, as long as there are rules. So they make rules about why it is you can get whipped, agitation, refusing to work and the like. And then it's 10 lashes with a strap determined at least by the officials. So these are called the tally rules after the guy who brings the lawsuit. And what happens then is there's a new trial, basically, arguing that this is unconstitutional of the U.S. Constitution, that it is cruel and unusual punishment. It's quite usual. Of course, they're doing it to many, many, many people. And in 1968, a federal judge named Harry Blackman, who goes on to be on the U.S. Supreme Court, writes a long, long rambling opinion in which you see echoes of the global here. He says that the use of the strap is no longer allowed. It offends contemporary concepts of decency and human dignity and precepts of the civilization which we profess to possess. And so he holds it unconstitutional. But in doing that, and in doing that, he raises a question, which is the centerpiece of some of the work I'm doing now, which is to say, okay, if you can't whip, what else is it you can't do? How do we decide what authorizes the sovereign power of the state. Now I wanna to flip toward the end rapidly. And to do that, I just wanna underscore, there's an uprising in Attica, which is in upstate New York. And I'm showing you this picture for two reasons. Do not read what I've described about Arkansas as a study about the South. It's a study about, it's a story about Amsterdam and England. And it's a story about upstate New York, across the world, these terrible institutions and political and social movements of the second half of the 20th century, many of them with prisoners at the forefront. Tally is the counterpart of Beccaria. He's got a different theory of sovereign punishment. He says, you can't punish me like that. Beccaria said you shouldn't. He says you can't. And this is part of that social movement. And then the U.S. Supreme Court develops, embraces Beccaria and Bentham and other political theorists. You've got to justify it. But when you look at the list of justifications, they're capacious and can do much work for virtually anything. And missing in action is the 20, second half of the 21st, 20th century, new insight, which is how are your purposes gonna recognize the equal status and personhood of the person who is being subjected to the power of the state? Now, moving to close, I have to- Judith, I am very sorry, yeah, but I, I see have that also- minutes. We're I taking have, perhaps some of Christina's time after- Okay, well, I have, two, I have two minutes and I'll end. Europe, the prison rules of Europe, which try to say, come close to the life of the prisons. The transnational rules, the Nelson Mandela rules, they're called, that are in 2015. And then that says no solitary confinement and try to do more. These are U.S. prisons, no romance of the new rights regime. And the bottom line questions as we think about politics 
and global governance and sovereignty and nationality and rights is it's not the level of jurisdiction, but the political will to deal with people as equals and then fund that meaning of that that needs to be at the center of our discussion. Thank you. Uh, Professor sure. Resnick, thank you so much for a very interesting and fascinating pr presentation. I, I just have one very quick question. I mean, uh, as far as we know, I, even though I mean none of us here is an expert, but solitary confinement is still a practice in um, a number of state prisons. Uh, as I've heard, and I've been, uh, I've been kind of familiar with one case in the state of Virginia. Um, the question that I have to you is whether, uh, I mean, as a number of corre uh, most correctional facilities are run by states. Are, is there a group of states which is moving a bit forward and a bit away from this old kind of thinking of confinement of, and of, of, of uh, partly severe and humiliating punishment uh, and are there states which are still lagging behind? So is there some, if I may paraphrase it, some light at the end of the tunnel, some, some prospect for change? Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, um I was preaching for a book uh, as part of the Lyman Center, working with something called the Correctional Leaders of America, which is the organization of all the directors of all the states in the U.S. And all system prisons are at the state level, as well as at the federal level. We've collected data every two years since 1913 on the use of solitary confinement in the United States. And the quick answer is that as of our 2019 data, which is before COVID, uh, more than um, 60,000 people at least were held 22 hours or more on average for 15 days or more, some for more than 3,000 for more than three years, some 3,000 or so were described by their own systems as seriously mentally ill. So step one is yes, it's a practice around the United States. Step two, quickly again, yes, conscious of your coffee, is that it is absolutely the case that there are some states that seek to end it or ban it or stop it at 15 days and there are uh, direct, I was saying, using the word abolition, there are directors of some prison systems who I would describe as abolitionists, certainly of solitary confinement and of wanting to reduce the use. And there, are, the big change in the last decade and the Nelson Mandela rules intersect with this in 2015 is that when we first started this work, um, the established corrections folks were hesitant to think that solitary confinement was a big problem or at least some of them. And what's shifted is, in my experience, people no longer say this is a terrific thing to do. It's justified as discipline, but there, and there is now more than 30 states that have legislation regulating the use of it and saying, I mean, sometimes it's just, it's just disclosure. Disclosure is important in terms of numbers and database. And sometimes it's not for juveniles. It's not for pregnant people. It's not for seriously mentally ill. It's not more than X days. You have to go in and out. And the biggest legislation out of New York called HALT uh, was just enacted to keep people um, no more than 17 hours in cell at a time. So you're watching a national movement called Stop Solitary, which is part of an international movement of which Mandela and some of the others, which defines something called prolonged or extended, prolonged is 15 days or more under Mandela. So, and there is some case law finding in individual settings, it's so abusive and some case law tolerating it. So it's more, and we have a Supreme Court that will not be the font of its uh, response. But there is this extended conversation and here coming back to Bill Yana's questions around, the global and the national and the local are all sites in which agenda setting can take place. And so the intense scrutiny and engagement and the UN's every five years are places for both exchange and norm generation and norm debate. So um, I can, if you are interested, we have both on the website and I can hand you, get you, they're tedious to read electronically, chapters, verse and database of five volumes of solitary confinement data in the United States um, and much more. I actually also write something about punishment in prison more generally. So happy to talk more about it, but don't want to intrude on your coffee. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you so much again, uh, Judith. Um, perhaps are there any other uh, questions or comments? I must say that 
in that uh, I, I'm not able to see um, the questions from the room, but I am definitely keeping an eye uh, on those that are um, present in virtual grads. So if there are any other questions, I see that um, we have a Yao still on the line and I wanted to put you two in a, in a conversation and perhaps um, give you the chance to um, to comment or to um, to say your thoughts. But if that is not the case, then I guess we can move to the um, the other panel um, and still there might be more debate uh, coming up um, after on concrete topics, I guess, um, of global governance and constitutionalism, I would say. I would still insist. Thank you. Thanks, Judith. 